Okay, Thomas, you can go. Yeah, so hello everybody and welcome at the Ackermann Award presentation session at CSL 21. So we are presenting the Ackermann Award 2020, um, which was for PhD thesis eligible uh, that were finished in 2018, 2019. So um, we are three people here from the jury and, and one additional person in the audience. So Simona Rongi della Rocca and Mikolai Bojancic are here. And um, of the main part will be the presentation by Benjamin Kaminski then afterwards. So let me just say some very few words about the award. Um, the award is given yearly. It's an award about a thesis. So we are we are selecting what we consider the best thesis under the nominated ones. And like in previous years, it's often very difficult because there are outstanding PhD theses in our area. And um, sometimes we really need long discussions to to yeah distinguish one of them because very often there are several ones that are very good so and being the one that is uh, selected in really means something um, usually in normal years i would thank our sponsor now for uh, paying the journey of the of the award winner but this year it's it's not so expensive but but still as they volunteered to for it i at least would like to have their name here even if we don't uh, write a, a receipt afterwards okay so um i'm looking forward to the presentation, but I'm also looking forward to what Mikowai has to say about the thesis. Thank you, Thomas. It is uh, my great pleasure to um, well, announce once again uh, the winner of this year, who is uh, Benjamin Lucien Kaminski. Uh, uh, Benjamin uh, did his uh, uh, undergraduate uh, studies and his thesis in, uh, in Aachen. Uh, and is currently a lecturer in uh, the University College of London. And uh, uh, regarding his thesis, well, you'll get to see it in a moment, uh, uh, parts of it, uh, but I will just read out uh, a few sentences from the citation. So, uh, uh, Benjamin Lucien Kaminski uh, receives the 2020 Ackerman Award of the EACSL for his thesis, Advanced Weakest Precondition Calculi for Probabilistic Programs. Uh, the major contribution of this thesis is calculi in the style of weakest condition calculus for tasks such as providing bounds on expected running time, e.g. finite uh, expected running time, pro uh, proving almost sure termination or computing uh, conditional expected values. Due to the subtle nature of probabilistic programs, these are results which require extraordinary skill. At the same time, the thesis is expected to make, in fact, it already has made, an important uh, impact due to the promising and wide-ranging applications. Finally, uh, the quality of the exposition is exemplary. We have almost 400 pages of lucid explanations and well-chosen examples. Uh, the thesis can uh, serve as a textbook for uh, newcomers in the field. So that, that you, you can read more from the uh, extended citation. I just wanted to add that uh, as part of the jury, we were really impressed by, by uh, the, the extraordinary care that was uh, taken uh, with excellent effects uh, by Benjamin in writing his thesis. And uh, uh, he can thus uh, uh, stress and put to shame future generations of uh, PhD uh, writers. Uh, so uh, I, just, I give the floor now to Benjamin and congratulations uh, on behalf of the entire jury to you. Thank you. And, but before we, we continue with the presentation, I would like to hand over the, the certificate to Benjamin. So we, we didn't try that out. So I hope it, it, it works at the first uh, attempt. So I'm giving it over to Benjamin and I hope, yes, it worked. Great. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Congratulations. And um, yeah, it's very well deserved. And hopefully it will be good for you to, to have it. <laughs> I, I think so. Yeah, thank you very much. It's, um, yeah, it's an incredible honor to receive this award. Uh, also seeing past winners, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I feel very, very honored. Yeah, thanks to the to the jury. I would have never expected that, but uh, yeah, I'm very happy. Yeah. Um, okay, I I will share my screen now. Did that work? Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, I will. I will start, right? Cool. Okay. Yeah. So this is my, um, this is basically my uh, defense presentation. So I think none of you or hardly any of you have been at my defense. So maybe this is new to you. Uh, if you want to um, uh, read the thesis, there's a QR code. Uh, you can scan that and then uh, you get a link to my thesis page. Yeah, so the title of the thesis is Advanced Weakest Preconditioned Calculi for Probabilistic Programs. And I'm going to present to you one or two calculi, depending on time, um, from my thesis. And then finally, some uh, results on the hardness of reason, the computational hardness of reasoning about probabilistic programs. Oh, OK. Yeah, so uh, as for motivation, I think I'm not telling any of you anything new if I say that humanity is increasingly reliant on software and software today makes safety critical decisions. Uh, in that capacity, software has unfortunately already killed people. So this is um, a famous example. This is a Theorac 25. This is actually not a Theorac 25, but it looks uh, a little bit like this. So this is a, a radiation therapy device. And there was um, a race condition. So in this case, a concurrency bug that caused to the, the device to deliver overdoses to people, um, actually very high overdoses. And at least three people have died from this directly. Severe uh, injuries occurred to several other people. Um, so this is really dangerous if software uh, makes mistakes. Now, probabilistic programs, this is a newly emerging paradigm. It's actually not so new, but it, it has gained uh, a lot of interest in the past, let's say, decade or so. This is used in cryptography, security, but uh, very, very importantly nowadays in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And in there also uh, probabilistic programs do make safety critical decisions nowadays on an experimental basis so far, but um, this is going to increase most likely. So these programs might kill people in the future. Here is a, an example. This is an Uber AI autonomous car. So this is a self-driving car and Uber is experimenting with a um, with a probabilistic programming language called Pyro. This is based on Python. And um, yeah, these, these programs basically stir, steer these cars. So it's very important that also probabilistic programs uh, have no bugs. And we would like software to have no bugs, but there's kind of mathematical evidence by Church and Turing that this is it's kind of hopeless to, um, to hope that uh, we will not ever have any bugs in software. But we can try, uh, and this is what we do here. So one way out of this is uh, testing. So we can test our software heavily, but of course, this is a little bit like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And actually, because we're talking about infinite state systems, this is an infinite haystack where we're trying to find a needle. So here's a picture to demonstrate this. 
here we want to play sort of a verification game. So we want to see whether we can, uh, we're not trying to find a needle here, but a specific straw in this haystack. And we want to know, is this blue straw here actually one of the green ones? So in other words, can we get from this green area to this single blue area, which could be a bug? Yeah, and we can test this and we can see this one. No, we get here. No, no. Yeah, we can actually test a lot of these. And here we have now covered 91% of our area here, except for these two. But if the haystack was infinite, of course, we have covered 0% of our haystack. Um, and in fact, there is one blue straw here, goes here, and we can get here. So yeah, this testing, this is a quote by Dijkstra, testing can be very effective, uh, be a very effective way to show the presence of bugs, as we can see here, but it's hopelessly inadequate for showing their absence. And this is what verification does. Right, so testing, trying to find a needle in the infinite haystack, verification, this is a, a different task, if you will. We're trying to prove that there is no needle whatsoever in the infinite haystack. So these are kind of complementary techniques for making our software more safe and secure. And we, in this thesis, or I am focusing on verification. Okay, and in particular, I'm doing verification of probabilistic programs. So what is a probabilistic program? This is like an ordinary program, um, but it has additionally the ability to flip a coin. So we can see here, this program flips a coin, a fair coin. So it's a half and a half, uh, the outcome, and either does nothing or increases X by two. Uh, clearly here, the control flow depends on the outcome of the coin flip. Um, and the question is now, what does this program do? Well, we can run it on some initial state sigma and we obtain a probability distribution, which we denote this way, <clears throat> sorry, over final states. Here's um, an example. So we start with uh, a point mass where um, x is five with probability one, and then we can either do nothing, so with probability half, it's still five, or increase x by two, so with probability again, a half, x is now seven. And this can actually be a sub-distribution, so the total probability mass can be less than one because the program may not terminate. And if it doesn't terminate, then this missing probability mass, this is what we, this is how we model the probability of non-termination. Okay, now the output, as we just saw, is not determined, it's not deterministic, but it's influenced by the, by the randomness. So we cannot longer say the algorithm uh, is either correct or incorrect but we can only say, well, it's correct up to a certain probability. Of course, this probability can be one, but uh, this is most likely not very useful. So usually probabilistic programs are used um, so that they have a small error, a small probability of producing an error. But uh, on the other hand, they, for instance, give you a speed up in the computation. So it makes sense to reason about the correctness probability. Uh, same thing goes for the runtime. The runtime can also be undetermined and influenced by the randomness. So the, the worst case runtime is not really relevant here, but the expected runtime is something that is more relevant. Yeah, and as you see here, probability, expected runtime, this is something where we really want uh, to put quantities on, on stuff, on properties. We don't want to say, well, this is either true or false. We want to really put a number on it. And this is what I'm going to show you now. So let's see an overview of uh, the rest of the talk. I will first explain the, the classical calculi that's been um, well, 
there was a seminal work by Cozen and later by McIver and Morgan, who coined the term weakest pre-expectations. So I will show you this classical calculus for reasoning about probabilistic programs, and in particular show you how to use induction to reason about loops. Uh, then I will show you what I did, and this is um, a, a similar calculus for ex reasoning about expected runtimes and time permitting. I will show you how to reason about mixed sign uh, random variables. And then I will show you something about the computational hardness of reasoning about um, probabilistic programs. And then I will conclude. All right, so part one, the classical weakest pre-expectation. Um, yeah, what are expectations? This is a, a slightly confusing term. So you read the term expectations, but you th should think that this is a random variable. So do not think expected value yet. So what is an expectation? This is the set of all expectations and it's just functions. And the functions map uh, or associate quantities to program states. So these are functions f that map program states to positive real numbers or infinity. And because we restrict to positive real numbers and put a top element, an artificial infinity element at the top, we actually have a complete lattice with a partial order on these functions. So a function f, an expectation f is smaller than g if it is pointwise smaller, so on all states that I could plug in here. So it just says f is dominated by g. Right, this is the domain on which our calculi work on. And here's uh, the classical weakest pre-expectation uh, notion. So we are given a program C, probabilistic program C, and an expectation F. This We think of this as a post-expectation. So it's similar to a post-condition uh, for Dijkstra's weakest precondition calculus. And we want to know what is the expected value of F after executing the program C. Here's a picture to um, see this a bit more clearly. So we start on some initial state sigma, <clears throat> then we run the program C and it might take different paths here because of the randomness. Yeah, we can branch and take different, different execution paths here. And then we end up in different final states, tau one, two, three, and so on, could be infinitely many. What do we do now? We measure the quantity f in every final state here. And then we just take a weighted sum over that. So we take the expected value, right? Every path has a certain probability. We multiply the probability with this quantity and sum everything up. OK, we could have started with a different initial state sigma prime. Then the computation might go a bit differently. We might end up in different final states. Again, we just measure f in the final states, take the expected value, so the average weighted sum. And yeah, what do we get? We get a mapping from these initial states to these expected values. And this is what we call the weakest pre-expectation. So this is again of the same type. It's um, it's something that we we note by WPCF, and it's something that maps a state to a positive real number or infinity. So it's this mapping from here to here, here to here. This is what uh, the classically a weakest pre-expectation is. Let's see some examples. So this is a non-probabilistic example. We want to know what is the expected value of x squared after assigning x to 5. We could also think about this as an anticipated value because we don't have to, we have no randomness here. And of course, this is just 5 squared, which is 25. For 10, it's 100. Uh, now we see something probabilistic. So 
with probability 4 over 5, we set x to 5, and otherwise we set x to 10. What's now the expected value of x squared? Well, with probability 4 over 5, it's the expected value from this program here, so 25 plus 1 over 5 times 100, which is 40. Okay, a more interesting example. Here, we, uh, we actually already saw this example. It was uh, right from the beginning. So either do nothing or increase x by 5. What's the expected value of x? Assuming that x is a positive uh, variable. Well, either we do nothing, so it's just x again, or we increase x by 2. So in total, this gives us x plus 1. Yeah, and this means if I want to know after executing this program, what is the expected value of x, and I want to know this a priori, then I can expect that this quantity is x plus 1. Okay, here are the rules how to compute this. Uh, it's actually not so uh, important, but what is important and nice is that you can define this by induction on the program structure, right? So you have a rule for an assignment for a sequential composition. You see here, we just plug uh, one function into the other. For if then else, it's also like this. So we see whether the guard is true if yes, then we take the expected value of the program C1. If the guard is false, we look at C2. Same goes for the probabilistic choice. So either C1, uh, uh, either with probability P, we look at C1, 1 minus P, we look at C2. And for the while loop, we use a least fixed point construction. So if the loop guard is false, we immediately evaluate to F, to the post expectation. If the loop guard is true, we recurse here on the loop body. And yeah, in total, we have least fixed point here. So uh, in particular, this rule for sequential composition is very nice because it gives us a continuation passing transformer, uh, which we can use to reason about probabilistic programs. So if here we have the program C2, and we want to know what is the expected value of f, then the transformer wp transforms this into another function, which is the expected value of f after executing this program, c2. And this is evaluated here in these states, and this is evaluated in the initial states before executing c2. And now if we prepend this program with another one, then we just pass this uh, into the transformer, and this gives us the expected value of this expression after executing this program, which is, in other words, the expected value of this expression f after executing the two programs in sequence. And this is now evaluated here in the initial states. Yeah, so what does this mean? Actually, for our uh, haystack example, we're just turning around the arrows here and we start from the back and just see, do we get here to the green area? Okay, let's look at loops. How do we handle loops? So here's the definition uh, of the least fixed point, which defines the weakest pre-expectation for a loop. And um, if we call this here phi of x, then this is the least fixed point of phi. Because this function is monotonic in uh, our complete lattice of expectations, this implies that the least fixed point exists due to many, many folklore theorems. Um, but the problem, as we will see in part three, is that this least fixed point is in general not computable. So what we need is some reasoning about this least fixed point. And we have here something which is called Park induction, which is very handy. We guess some candidate i, which should be an upper bound on this weakest pre-expectation. And we see whether if we push i through this phi function once, if then we go down in our partial order, then by 
Park induction, we see that I itself is already an upper bound on the least fixed point of phi. And this is very nice because usually this, this least fixed point is the result of some um, infinite or, or even sometimes even transfinite uh, fixed point iteration. But if we guess something good, we just have to apply phi once and tell us something about um, an infinite iteration of phi. Okay, here's an example of uh, such an induction. It's a program that actually, yeah, basically keeps flipping a coin. And if the coin lands on zero, then we stop. And otherwise we increase a counter X by one. Uh, and we want to know what is the expected value of the counter after executing this program. And here is um, here is a candidate. I say the an upper bound on this is the initial value of x plus uh, the indicator function of c being one. So if c is one, then in expectation I will add one to to this counter. Yeah, and we can do induction on this. So we take phi of i. Write this down, and for um, then we have to push this invariant, so to speak, through the loop body. This gives us this. So uh, x is increased by one in this branch, and c is set to zero in the the purple branch. And each of that happens with probability half. This can be simplified a little bit. We can plug this in here. This simplifies again to this which is i itself. So we have proven actually that i is a fixed point and thus it's also i is smaller than phi of i. This is good. So by Park induction, we now know that x plus the indicator function of c being one uh, is an upper bound on the expected value of x after executing this program. All right, none of this was my work. Now I'm going to show you my work. It was, however, uh, important to understand this because you will see that my work uh, on expected runtime reasoning adds only a very, very tiny thing, but it's very effective. Um, we look at expected runtimes. Okay, and let's first look what happens if we naively try to use um, just the weakest pre-expectation calculus for reasoning about expected runtimes. So here's a program, while true, increase the counter X. And we could think, well, X accounts for the runtime because every time I do an iteration, I increase X by one. So let's just do induction. Uh, I want to know what is the expected value of x. But now I will do something mean. I will propose as a candidate upper bound the constant zero function. And now we try to do induction. It shouldn't work, but it will. So we push the zero through this body here. So zero and zero increase x by one, but nothing happens here. So it's still zero. We put zero here and this gives us zero. So it's just zero. And now we have proven by induction that zero is an upper bound on the expected value of X. Now this is not wrong uh, because uh, this WP calculus tells us what is the expected value of X measured in the final states after executing this program. But there are no final states. This program will loop forever and yeah, it will never reach a final state. So this, you can think of this like a, a null or an empty distribution. And if we integrate over an empty distribution, the result is just zero. So this shows us that uh, using this WP calculus for expected runtimes just simply doesn't work. Yeah. So what do we do instead? We come up with a dedicated calculus for reasoning about expected runtimes. And again, it should work in a continuation passing style. So here we have a program C2 and we have a post runtime T. So this is just some time that we need 
we assume to need after executing C2. And this gets now transformed into an expected runtime. And this is the expected time needed to do first execute C2 and then let time T pass. And if we have another program in front, we again transform this. And this is now the execute, uh, expected time needed to first execute C1 and then let this time pass. Or in other words, first execute C2, uh, C1, then execute C2, and then let time t pass. Yeah, and if we want to know only the expected runtime of C1, C2, then we just plug in as post runtime t a zero, and then we get the expected runtime of the whole program. Um, yeah. So here are the rules for the ERT, the expected runtime transformer. Actually, these are the rules from the WP calculus. And now we did one very, very simple thing. We add plus one everywhere and we rename WP by ERT. This now looks like a super simple and stupid idea, but this is sound. So this will actually give us a calculus that is sound for reasoning about expected runtimes. And if we do induction with this calculus, the results are sound as well. So let's see an example how to do reasoning in this calculus, very simple example. So choose zero as post runtime, meaning after this program, we're done. Okay, now we copy the zero to two branches and skip gives us this plus one. So skip takes one unit of time and another one and another one. So this takes three units of time. The other branch takes one unit of time. And now the if then else, we say that we need one unit of time here for evaluating the loop guard. If it's true, we take one unit of time. If it's false, we take three units of time. Okay, let me collapse this on oh, the first simplify now collapse and now we prepend something probabilistic now we have this expression to start with copy that to both branches in this branch x is set to 10 this simplifies to 3 here x is decreased by 1 first and then set to sorry simplify then set to 4 this gives us 6 and now we have to average. So this happens with probability one over three here and this with two over three. And we take one unit of time for flipping the coin. So this uh, simplifies to five. So this means in order to execute this whole program and then do nothing, we need on average five units of time. Okay, let's look now at loops. This is of course the, the most interesting thing. So again, this is defined as a least fixed point, but now with this one plus thing here. And uh, yeah, again, this is a monotonic function. The fixed point is again, not computable. So we again use park induction. And here is now uh, this example. Um, we choose as post runtime zero. So after that, we're done. And here's a candidate upper bound. It's one plus, if C is one, then six units of time. I will give you some intuition on this six. So first the one, we definitely need one unit of time to check whether the loop guard is true. If the loop guard is true, then we do the following. We definitely uh, look, uh, well, we definitely flip this coin once, that's one. Then we definitely do either this or that, that's another unit of time. And then we definitely check the loop guard again. So that's three units of time. How often does this happen on average? Two times on average. So three times two is six. So it's one plus whenever C is one, then on average, another six steps, six computation steps. Yeah, and we can now prove that my intuition is actually true. 
So we can take this, there's a plus missing, uh, this characteristic function. We yank that through the loop body and it simplifies. We put this here and it simplifies again. We have actually found a fixed point or guessed a fixed point. And now this tells us, yes, this is an inductive uh, expression. So the expected runtime is in fact uh, bounded by one plus if C is one, uh, six. Yeah, this is in fact bounded by seven. So this is, uh, this is a constant expected runtime, even though this loop actually admits infinite length uh, computations. Okay, we also did a case study. This is considered to be a very difficult case study. The coupon collector problem It's very famous, has a Wikipedia entry and was studied by Erdős and Remy. So it's obviously very important. This is the problem. You have uh, N different coupons and you want to, um, you, you can buy one coupon at a time, uh, but you get a random coupon. So the probability of uh, buying a specific type is one over N. And you want to have a full collection. So you want to have every type at least once. And the question is how many coupons do you have to buy on average to complete your album or, or your coupon collection? Yeah, and uh, this uh, we can model this by, by this uh, actually a tiny probabilistic program with a nested loop. And we can use our expected runtime transformer to analyze this. And we get this expression here. So four plus uh, 2n times the nth harmonic number roundabout, which is an O of n log n, actually in theta of n log n. Uh, this is known, of course, but we, we used our ERT transformer to reason about this directly on the source code with no ad hoc or meta reasoning about random variables or any of this. Yeah, I want to tell you about some very related work. This is the, the Delta Calculus by Siliko and MacIver. We discovered that only later. Fortunately, because otherwise we would have maybe stopped our investigations. This is very similar, but it doesn't feature continuation passing. So in some sense, this calculus is more tedious to work with. And um, I, I would say it's a bit more difficult to reason in this calculus. Uh, we also did something for recursive probabilistic programs. Um, and there's also already work building on our calculus. So our calculus was um, certified and mechanized in Isabel Hall by um, Hölze at TU Munich. Uh, he also found a mistake in one of our uh, examples. So it's always very good if this is mechanized in an interactive proof assistant. Yeah, and uh, our calculus was also used to prove the soundness of an automated technique for inferring expected runtimes by no at all. I'm probably pronouncing this incorrectly. Sorry about that. Yeah, then uh, as future work, we wanted to work on amortized expected runtimes. So can we come up with a calculus for amortized expected runtimes? And yeah, there we need to, um, we want to average over multiple executions of the same program. And there's a very nice method called the potential method. There you have a potential function. Uh, so you have the amortized expected runtime, which is the expected runtime plus a potential after this program minus the potential before. And this minus is what causes problems. So here, this can become in principle arbitrarily negative. So we leave our domain of, um, yeah, of, expect, uh, of, of positive real numbers here. Um, yeah, and this is why such a calculus must be able to handle negative runtimes as well. And for this, we need reasoning about mixed sign expectations. Um, 
yeah, I will go through this very quickly. So we have time for part three as well. Uh, here's an example program. So this program sets C to one, X to two. And while C is one, we either set C to zero or we multiply X by minus two. And we want to now know what is the expected value of X after executing this program. And this gives us something quite ill behaved. So it's one times a half plus one over four times minus four and so on. And this is one minus one plus one minus one and so on. So this is very bad. This doesn't converge and it also doesn't diverge to infinity or minus infinity. It's just very bad. Uh, how do we deal with this? So uh, we use something that we call integrability witnessing pairs. So we look at classical probability theory. And one that is integral over f is if the integral over the absolute value of f is finite. Now, only then this makes sense. Yeah, and in this case, f is called integral. Okay, so we just stick to concept and we reason about expected values and the integrability simultaneously. And for this, we just use pairs, so f and b of x. But now f is mixed sign, so we map states to any real number. And g is a classical expectation, so positive. And we want that G dominates the uh, absolute value of F. And here is a picture. So this is the state space, so to speak. And this is the positive real line or negative. Then we have some F and just G bounds the expected, uh, sorry, the absolute value of F. And here G may go to infinity, that's fine. Um, so this is a valid pair, this is also a valid pair, and this is not, right, because here f exceeds g. Yeah, so um, the problem now with these pairs is that we cannot define uh, a weak pre-expectation transformer on these, because the fixed point iteration for loops does not converge for all of the same reasons as we saw before. But we can now take equivalence classes of these pairs. And the equivalence classes, they mean that whenever G is infinity, then we don't care about the value of F. Yeah? So this is equivalent if they agree on, on the F1 values wherever G is not infinite. So it just means Please only care for f if, if g is not infinite. And now we can define a WP transformer on these equivalence classes. And here's a, a picture of such an equivalence class. So here's an f. And here g goes to infinity. So this is a point where we should not care about the value of f. So we can cut out something here and put it anywhere. And this is all in the same equivalence class. Yeah. Okay, and now on these equivalence classes, we can uh, define a weakest pre expectation transformer. And there, yeah, if we do a fixed point iteration on the equivalence classes, then it converges, but not to a certain pair, but it converges also to an equivalence class. And yeah, here's this example. If we ask what is the expected value of x after executing the loop, then we ask for the expected value of this equivalence class, so x and absolute value of x. And the result is this, it's zero. And for the, for the absolute value of x part, it's infinity whenever x is not zero. And what's the interpretation? Well, if f is initially not zero, then the whole thing diverges and we should not care and uh, it's undefined. And if x is initially zero, then everything is fine. So then the expected value of x is zero. Yeah, this was just a short um, 
outlook on this um, integrability witnessing calculus. Now, uh, for the final part, I'll get to something completely different. And this is the, the computational hardness of reasoning about probabilistic programs. This is actually the first thing I did in my PhD because I took uh, a class on recursion theory by uh, Wolfgang Thomas, which was very, very nice. And um, yeah, that kind of inspired me to do this work. So there is kind of a, a dispute in the literature, or there was a dispute in the literature on whether reasoning about probabilistic programs is more difficult than reasoning about normal, ordinary programs or not. And here's a quote by Morgan. Uh, he says, probabilistic reasoning for partial correctness is not much more complex than standard reasoning. And here is something by Espasa and others, um, and others who uh, looked at almost sure termination. And he says, or they say, ordinary termination is a purely topological property, but almost sure termination is not. Proving almost sure termination requires arithmetic reasoning not offered by termination proofs. So actually Morgan and Aspasa are not talking about the same thing. One is partial correctness, the other one is total correctness, but still, yeah, you feel that there is kind of, uh, yeah, people didn't know whether one is more complex than the other. Yeah, so my question was, was, what precisely is the complexity of reasoning about probabilistic programs? And I did this in the uh, arithmetical hierarchy. This is um, something where we can measure uh, the complexity of undecidable sets. So, of course, we could stop at undecidability and say, well, this is undecidable, so it's not solvable, really. But we can also ask how undecidable is something. And this is what the arithmetical hierarchy is useful for. But it's also useful because if we put something at a certain level in the arithmetical hierarchy, then we can give, um, we, we understand something about the, the, the logic of this problem because the, this hierarchy has a close relationship to logic and arithmetic. And it looks a little bit like this. Well, it looks actually precisely like this. It's a, a two-stranded hierarchy. Um, if on the left, you have a sigma side, and here you have a pi side. This is related to quantifier alternation in logic. So here you have decidable problems here at this very bottom level. So this is the, the delta levels are the intersections of the, the sigma and pi. Here you have semi-decidable problems and everything else is completely undecidable. Yeah, and we can put some problems here. For instance, the classical halting problem, does uh, a deterministic program terminate on a given input? And this is complete for sigma one. So it's semi-decidable, right? If I have an input and a program, basically what I can do is I can just run it and wait until it terminates. If it does, I can say yes. And if it doesn't, I cannot say much. The universal halting problem, so does it terminate on all inputs? This is complete for pi two. And here you see kind of the quantifier alternation because it says, uh, for all inputs, does the program terminate? So we have for all exists, and this is pi two. So you see here, there's a complexity jump from H to UH. So we go up and to the right. Yeah, what's the, the hardness of reasoning about weakest pre-expectations? So we are given a probabilistic program and an input. Uh, and a post expectation F and a rational number Q. And we now ask, that's this problem, L exp, is Q a lower bound on the expected value of F after executing program C on initial state sigma. And this is complete for sigma one. And if we ask for upper bounds, then we go actually here, so 
So we go one level up. This is strictly more difficult. And if we want to know what is, is, is this precisely the expected value, then we are here. All right, this is for weakest pre expectations. Maybe a bit more uh, graspable is the problem of termination. So there are two different notions of terminations of probabilistic programs. So we are again given a program and an input and we ask for almost sure termination. So this means does the program terminate on a given input with probability one? This problem is immediately pi two hard, actually pi two complete. We can also ask the universal variant. So does the program terminate on all inputs? And now you can see if we put a for all quantifier in front of something that is already for all quantified, this doesn't change the complexity. So this problem uh, surprisingly is also, um, yeah, pi two complete. It's it's only surprising if you don't know that AST is not pi. Uh, yeah, if you don't know that AST is pi two. Once you know that AST is pi two complete, this is kind of obvious. But it's yeah, if if you look at it and start investigating this, it's very surprising that these two problems are in the same complexity class. Um, for positive almost sure termination, this is this problem, and it asks is the expected runtime finite. So if the expected runtime is finite, then the termination probability is necessarily one, but not the other way around. We can have termination probability one, but still infinite expected runtime. So this problem is sigma two complete and the universal variance. So is the expected runtime finite on all inputs is even harder. It's uh, pi three complete. Okay, so this is this is quite interesting because we can now ask what is a sensible notion of probabilistic termination? Is it almost sure termination or is it positive almost sure termination? Yeah, and uh, so this is more of a yeah, philosophical um, attempt at this. So the the question is here. Can I expect to witness termination of the algorithm within my lifetime? For AST, the answer is no, because the expected runtime may be infinite. For positive almost short termination, if, if the number is small enough, the answer is yes. So in this sense, positive almost short termination makes a lot more sense. Now, if we look at our theoretical considerations here in this hierarchy, then we can ask, does the problem become harder when moving from non-universal to universal termination? Uh, for the classical halting problem, this is true. We jump from here to here. Um, for almost zero termination, we don't jump, right? We stay in the same complexity class, which is really weird. So here the answer is no. It's just kind of unnatural. For positive almost short termination, yes, we do have a jump. So here the answer is yes. So I, I dare to say that positive almost short termination is maybe a more sensible notion of probabilistic termination than almost short termination. All right, to uh, conclude, there is some further work uh, covered in my thesis. This is about conditional weakest free expectations where you have an additional observed statement. This is particularly important in machine learning. We have developed a calculus for hard conditioning, which actually is not so much used in machine learning, more of the soft conditioning, but there are calculi for soft conditioning as well. Um, then I also, together with Christoph Mattia, investigated um, the computational hardness of reasoning about variance and covariance. And what is not covered in my thesis, um, we did some work on recursion. recursion, recursion. Um, actually, first order recursive probabilistic programs. There's also a lot of work on higher order probabilistic programs, which poses many, many semantical 
problems and there's there are different um, schools of approaching this problem. Um, then we have developed uh, a quantitative separation logic. This is um, a weakest pre-expectation calculus, but also sort of a quantitative logic for reasoning about probabilistic programs with pointers and dynamic memory. Uh, we came up with, um, together with Marcel Haag, uh, a conceptually simple induction rule for lower bounds. We saw that the induction is for upper bounds. Lower bounds is a very difficult problem. We have a solution, but it's incomplete. Um, this year at Popo, we presented uh, something about relational weakest pre-expectations for proving sensitivity properties of probabilistic programs. And we also have an, um, an expressive syntax in which we can uh, capture these, um, these functions. Okay, to conclude, what you uh, saw here was uh, how weakest pre-expectation reasoning works classically. Uh, you saw a conceptually simple induction rule for upper bounds. Uh, what I did was advanced calculi for expected runtimes, mixed sign random variables, and what you didn't see here is for conditional expected values but you can read that in my thesis. And um, for computational hardness of the reasoning, I did show you about almost sure termination and positive almost sure termination. And in the thesis, you can read about variance and covariance. All right, that's it. I uh, thank you for your kind attention and uh, I'm happy to take questions. Yeah. Thank you very much for this super nice talk. It's mm. always nice for the jury if, if such a perfect talk comes about. So everybody sees why this thesis won, won the award, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's clear to everyone. So do you have any questions? Of course, there will be also the possibility to talk to Benjamin at Speaker's Corner in, in Gather. I hope that works, Benjamin, for you. For you. Um, yes, it okay. should work. I, I just yeah. didn't try, but I will. Okay. <laughs> Famous last words. Yeah. So if you want to be sure. Ah, so Alex, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, just a quick question. So you mentioned very briefly at the end, computational hardness results for um, variance and covariance. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm wondering, did you also look at, do, do the kind of reasoning methods you were talking about earlier in the talk, can they be extended to reasoning about variance and covariance? Yeah, we, uh, yeah, I didn't uh, speak about this. We, we did um, investigate that as well. So um, yeah, sort of a, um, WP calculus for reasoning about the variance and ex especially the variance of the expected runtime. Uh, we published this at KEST, uh, and you can also find it in this Acta Informatica um, paper. Oh, no, you cannot. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's at KEST. But um, I have to say the, the calculi that come out are not as elegant. So I, I don't like them so much. <laughs> and um, I think it, it would be much nicer if... Um, if we can came up with a, a better calculus for that, because it's yeah, this is obviously an interesting question, right? If you have runtime variance or low variance, you can shield um, in security. You can shield uh, algorithms against side channel timing attacks and such things. So I think this is an important problem, but we don't have a good solution to that. Okay, thank you. So, oh, are there any further questions? For so then otherwise, I would like to thank Benjamin again and everybody who attended the session. So there will be an Akamoto Award 2021. The call is not out yet, but the deadline will be in July 1, so like 
like last year. So there's some time left for that, but the, the call will be out soon. So please spread the word. And then I might say that there is the membership meeting of EACSL at 5.30, also here. So, and everybody is invited to, to take part. Every participant of CSL is a member of EACSL, even if you didn't know, and you can take part in the membership meeting in 30 minutes about. So see you there or see you at Gather Tower. Okay. Yeah, I'll try Thank to. Thank you, Benjamin, for the very